and the city council is uh, meeting is being held remotely through Zoom, and we have provided options for the public to attend through telephone, internet, or other means of remote access, and also provide the ability for persons attending the meeting, not in person, to hear each other at the same time. So if you would, I'd like to uh, invite you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have a packed agenda tonight. And the first item is an update on our community event center project. And uh, Nick has a number of individuals uh, from Rice Fergus Miller that are going to join us tonight and lead us through this discussion. Yeah, and I'll, I'll briefly speak to this while Brandy is letting everyone into the room. Um, Brandy, I think Dean, Holly, Jennifer, Lori, Michael, and Paul should all be admitted as panelists for this item. Um, <clears throat> tonight's presentation will be given by our consulting team, which includes Rice Fergus Miller, uh, KPFF, and KPG um, that, that provide the civil and, and landscape and architectural services for the Community Event Center project, as well as the task orders that the City Council approved um, providing for the expanded plaza design as well as the frontage improvement design along Bay Street. And um, I believe one of our guests is gonna be sharing a presentation tonight. I don't know um, which one of you is, is set to share. Um, Brandy, have you enabled sharing yet? Yes, you should be able to share. So um, why don't we begin? I will introduce the team uh, since it's been a while since they have presented. Um, Lori, do you want to go first and introduce yourself? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm Lori Limson Cook with Rice Fergus Miller. I'm the project manager for the design team. And um, did you want me to just mention everybody or you want them to introduce themselves, Nick? You can mention everybody. That's fine. Okay. So for um, Rice Fergus Miller, we have Dean Kelly as well. He's, he is our principal. Um, Mike Wright is supposed to be joining. Uh, there he is. Just He's tells. also a project uh, designer. And then we also have from KPFF, uh, Jennifer Clapham there, our civil engineer. And then from KPG, who is our landscape architect, we have Paul Fusel and Holly Williams. And uh, Paul is actually the one that's gonna share his screen during this presentation. Um, does he have that permission to do that? I do. Okay. And Brandy, I see we have one attendee from uh, the library district in the, on the audience to Sue Woodford, and you, you could bring her over to the meeting too, <clears> if you'd like. And Sue is uh, one of the, uh, on the board of trustees, I think that's what they're called for the Kitsap Regional Library and the representative representing the south end of the county, I believe. And if I'm not correct in that introduction, Sue, please correct me. She's nodding her you're, head. You're correct. Thanks. All right, Paul, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Yes, I will. Thank you. Everybody see that? Not yet. Okay. Oh, let's make sure I've got it. Hit that share button. There we go. There we go. All right. So uh, Jennifer, well, first, good evening. We're happy to be here, our team for the CEC and related uh, projects. Uh, Jennifer, Dean and I are going to speak to where we stand with all the different puzzle pieces around the event center and the event center itself and um, how they're progressing. So I'm gonna begin with the sub area plan and the vision of it. Um, the vision is to, um, you know, create a community destination along the waterfront with the CEC playing a critical role in its success. As such, as a team, we recognize that the overall goal continues to be to create a great place in downtown that is a community destination that is accessible and highly inviting for pedestrians for daily activities. So it's not just the buildings, it's the outside spaces, how everything links together. This diagram from the master plan shows all the pieces of the, the, of the puzzle, um, the CEC 
and the bank site and the pump station kind of form a triangle of structures that are centered on the Orchard Street Plaza. Um, they all relate then to uh, the space to the north, which is both a green space and parking lot, uh, the green space relating to some of the utilities of the pump station. Um, the Orchard Street Plaza also is related to a major crosswalk leading to future development on the south side of Bay Street. And Bay Street as a spine is connecting all these developments and um, providing the access to them and holds most of the utilities that Jennifer will speak to in a minute. And then bookending uh, these developments are Port Street and Frederick Street. So all of these are the about a dozen elements that we've been looking at. So where do we stand today? This is our current site layout with the CEC at the top of the, of the image. And what we have around the CEC from an exterior point of view is a variety of hardscape and softscape spaces. These spaces are designed particularly to reflect what's happening in the library and the different age groups are associated with certain spaces for spill out spaces to be outside. And then that particular kind of um, spatial quality of hard and softscape is then brought all the way across Orchard Plaza towards the bank site and even beyond that to the north and going all around the pump station connecting to the waterfront trail. And um, so far weaving these different developments and improvements together is really starting to turn into a series of very exciting spaces. Um, I'm gonna talk to those spaces in a second, but Jennifer now is gonna talk about uh, how all of these individual components are relating to each other. So um, as Paul has mentioned, there's a lot of activity that we've been tracking and looking at in this area. Uh, particularly, we've been focused heavily on the Bay Street spine, um, as Paul noted. We've got um, that piece really sort of becomes what all these adjacent projects build off of in a lot of ways. Um, some of the things that we've looked at of how to get Bay Street to work is we've looked at the existing right of way to make sure that the new layout that we have actually fits within that existing property zone that is designated as right of way. Um, part of that has driven us to actually look at reducing the speed limit through this area down to 20 miles per hour. It's currently posted at 25. Um, another way that we've looked at fitting within that right of way is to actually super elevate this, the road. Currently, it's sort of a crowned condition. And what we're looking at is actually tilting the whole thing so that as you go around the curve, it's, it's somewhat of an intuitive um, vehicle experience as you're going around those curves. Um, we are also looking at raising the crossing of the orchard. And so that facility will actually lift up. And so pedestrians will continue all at the sidewalk elevation and cars will further slow down to help go across that and help with the pedestrian experience. Um, we have coordinated with the fire department. And so we are accommodating fire access along the westbound side of the road. So the north side, the, the island that is located there is going to be drivable by the fire department. Um, it won't be comfortable for a car, but it will be comfortable for the fire department to be able to get through there. Um, we've also, the other piece that we needed to solve for this was, could we deal with the stormwater? Could we get stormwater for these new, new improvements around and out? One of the ways that we've been able to tap into that is by lifting the road elevation as a whole to also help with the, the ponding and the, 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 the storm surges that can often get found at that intersection of Orchard. So another benefit of being able to lift up this area to, to help with that connection and then also be able to get our conveyance and stormwater system to drain out. The other item to note for this Bay Street condition is the fact that we'll be undergrounding, the plan is to underground the overhead utilities um, through Schedule 74 process. Um, Kitsap Bank has been in the coordination with what we've been talking about. Um, so one of the pieces obviously is what finished floors are these buildings being set at and how do those relationships start to come to be? Utility services are also a component of those, those new facilities coming in. Community event center, I'm on that project as well. So I, I have that familiarity of how do we get services for those for both water and sewer services. So good news is I think we've got a, a good high level plan that conceptually uh, the city can move forward with. 
Uh, the Port of Bremerton is also doing projects out on the shoreline side of the work. So those are the two dark blues. Those are probably new to most folks for the current, it's a recent development. Um, Nick, I'm not sure if there's anything more we need to speak to on that other than they're tracking this project and we're looking to coordinate with them with the CEC shoreline work that we're planning. Yeah, I'll just mention that they're doing their breakwater project to protect the marina. And as part of that project, they have to provide mitigation. And so those existing uh, pilings off the 7-Eleven, they're proposing to remove. And then there's possible mitigation uh, on the other area labeled port along the shoreline to remove some of the armoring and soften that area up as, a, as an environmental enhancement. But that, that will be sorted out through the, the permitting process through the Department of Fish and Wildlife and through the city's shoreline uh, permit process. And so we don't have the, the final details of that just yet. Anything else? Okay. okay. Thank you. So um, as we weave these spaces together, we have all these outdoor spaces that are all going to merge uh, um, around each of these facilities. And it really is um, important that the grades are accessible for connections and that utilities are, are there, as Jennifer said. And um, these pictures are really to talk about how visitors will experience the look and feel of the outdoor spaces. And these pictures are just some of the ideas of how we can design a hard and softscape balance between the two and really accentuate a friendly kind of beachy waterfront feel with art, decorative pavement, green spaces for plants and lawn, maybe some trees and a wide variety of seating. So that leads to one important element called activation. Um, activation happens informally when buildings have certain interfaces bringing people in and out of that the exterior spaces get filled with people. Um, and it can also happen formally where you program events. So this diagram was done by GGLO's a study to take a look at the range of more formal activation. Uh, that includes not just hard fixed seating along planter edges, but also movable furniture, cafe style seating where you can move the tables and the chairs. And you can rearrange those however you want to program those. Uh, Pop-up retail that could happen during the week or weekends that somebody can come in and do some informal marketplace. Uh, maybe a small stage that could be used for small music events or a small theater. Um, there's a whole variety of things, bringing in a food truck or other some sort of vendor on weekends for food. And so we've already done this around the event center and now we're really kind of making sure that we have Orchard Street Plaza activated and we're still at the beginning of this, but this then leads to a discussion around the CEC and opportunities that have come up because of looking at the external site. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dean. Thank you, Paul. Um, so, you know, right now where we are with the CEC project, we completed our uh, schematic design package uh, last year and are now just kicking off our, uh, our design development. So in the interim, we've been working on all of these site projects, the various overlapping um, projects here outside of the buildings that, um, that Paul and Jennifer have just spoken to. Uh, so as we were in kind of that uh, interim state, some ideas started uh, gestating around what we could do with the CEC. So I want to talk in particular about what you're going to see here in the bottom uh, right, uh, left-hand corner, this service area that, that is essentially kind of on the, uh, the west end of the plaza along Bay Street. Um, so the overall vision for the CEC, you know, is to create this connection back to the waterfront. So most of the glazing, most of the spaces kind of flow out towards that waterfront. Um, but, you know, there's kind of this interesting uh, challenge here where we don't wanna forget about Bay Street and the opportunities to also activate Bay Street. Um, so with the current configuration, we have the, uh, the covered teens outdoor space. There was an idea for a little walk-up kiosk. And then there's kind of the overall architecture of the building that brings you into the plaza and the main entry. But the, uh, the corner there on the Southwest of the building was really all kind of devoted to, uh, to service. Now we need service, we know for the library to function, for the event center to function, we need good access to service and loading, which is why this was originally located in this area where it would have good, uh, good access there from the side street uh, for, uh, for vehicles to pull in and load for events. Uh, 
but we started to ask ourselves: is is there a way we can have it have have both can we have good access but also find a way to uh to activate the street so we started with a few um just kind of high level studies i want to emphasize that these are very preliminary our team sketched out a few ideas and we we brought these to uh, Mayor Rob and to Nick, and uh, and then it was uh, it was suggested that we bring these here to uh, to to the city council uh, to get your your uh, eyes on this. So these still need to be vetted by by the team, and we're going to start to explore this in greater detail as we move into design development. But uh, Paul, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we're going to talk here about this area outlined in the red box, uh, and the main thing that we're looking to create is instead of having that solid corner that has the exit stair, loading, storage, a service elevator, can we create a, uh, a retail tenant space that could, uh, could serve to activate the street? Um, one other thing that we think is, is pretty interesting about this idea is this could also create a separate revenue stream uh, outside of you know, the, the two tenants currently in the building, the library, and then whatever events are happening in the event center. Um, so it would add overall a little bit of square footage, but our thought was that that could likely be offset with the potential revenue stream that, that could be generated. Uh, this could be a retail tenant, it could be office space. We're currently showing about 1400 square feet. Um, if you can go to the next slide, Paul, it, it kind of gives you an overall comparison. So there on the left was the original design that we landed on at the end of schematic design. Uh, and then the proposed revisions, or at least our first pass at what these proposed revisions could look like is there on the right. Um, areas highlighted in yellow are added square footage. So there is on this level about uh, 1,080 square feet that, uh, that would potentially be added by this change. Uh, this would also shift around some of the, uh, some of the workspace that's been provided for KRL. So again, we need to uh, to get with uh, the KRL team and, and work through this. This was kind of a first pass. And uh, Mike and I both think that, that this is at least as functional, if not more functional than the original design, but certainly wanna get everyone's uh, that will be interacting with this space to take a look at it. Um, but where the, uh, the second floor cantilevers out, where you can see those two posts um, on the left-hand side, we're essentially filling that in so that that would go from the bottom all the way up and just kind of capture that square footage and then if you go to the next page, uh, this shows the, uh, the, the second floor overall, just as a reference. So let's jump to the next slide. Um, this shows kind of the overall reconfigured space and it's probably a little easier. One more slide will show us the comparison side by side. Um, so again, uh, some changes to the, to the light lab with the, with the stair shifting. Uh, but otherwise, all the main components are, are really left intact. We have the service elevator uh, would come up still kind of being that main area where loading is happening. Uh, with a double-sided elevator, we could have direct access into a larger event storage space. Um, I've worked on a lot of hospitality projects and there is never enough storage. That's always, anytime we renovate, that's always the thing that there's not enough of. So, um, you know, we think that uh, again, as a preliminary pass, this seems to uh, to kind of, you know, give us the, the access that we need for service, but also, you know, uh, create an opportunity to activate what's what's a pretty valuable piece of real estate along Bay Street there. And on this page, as you can see with the uh, 404 square feet, you know, a minimal amount of square footage there in that yellow zone that, that we're adding just to kind of push the building envelope out. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Paul, this is the, uh, the rendering that we landed on at the end of schematic design. Uh, so again, this is the corner that we're talking about. That bottom section is the area in question. You know, again, very solid. So I think another benefit of this potentially is to add additional transparency on the uh, Bay Street side. So this is a, a kind of a quick sketch on the next slide, if you can go forward. Um, basically filling that in with storefront, much more transparency. And, uh, you know, with, uh, with the architectural language of the building, I don't believe this, this uh, will, will fight with any of that. I think it will, it will fit right in with the rest of the architecture that we've already uh, arrived at and create, um, you know, just a more dynamic um, appearance there on the street front and good opportunities for engagement. 
Um, and then we just have a couple more renderings that are just the, the rest of the building just added in here for reference, but no changes proposed uh, to the other sides of the building at this time. So that was kind of our update here on the CEC and uh, where we, we think uh, we'd like to take this uh, as we move from schematic design into design development. Council members, I know these are renderings and, and concepts, but um, I, I just want to get a reaction from you and your thoughts on, on so Cindy, go ahead. It's awesome. Uh, to open up that back corner with that kind of light um, is, is absolutely perfect. Um, considering some of the gray days that we have, um, anything to do with increasing light and transparency in this building is, I think is gonna be so welcome. Um, and to utilize that extra space um, and actually be able to have some sort of revenue, I think is a great idea. Other thoughts? Yes, Mark, go ahead. Um, I would okay. say spot on with storage and that double double service elevator. You're absolutely right. We always need more storage and hospitality venues. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to put it in after the fact, for sure. Yeah. How about the plaza spaces too? Like you know, maybe we can scroll back to that uh, that one image too. I think we're uh, this one. You know, and one of the things I thought, you know, it, my knee jerk reaction to the to the viewing stage. Gosh, we've got you know the gazebo down there, but if the farmer's market ends up in this space, which I think would be a fabulous uh, area for this. Sometimes they have, you know, somebody playing music and to have a little small stage. Um, so that, that idea, my, my initial reaction was, oh, really, do we need that? But um, I've really kind of warmed, warmed to that idea. Um, so I see Mark's got his hand raised and so does Councilmember Chang. Yeah, I, I really like what I'm seeing here as well. Um, both the exterior and the uh, open space there. In regards to, to filling in that uh, westernmost service area, do you guys foresee that being all glass as it kind of appeared in that in that uh, update drawing or, or a combination of, of all, or what do you see there as far as filling that in, how that would look from the Bay Street? Yeah, um, at this stage, uh, we've been envisioning this is is mostly glass or or potentially all glass, um, but you know there's certainly more exploration to be done there. Um, you know I think the uh, the transparency there would fit with the overall kind of simple architectural style that we have with the with the building, but um, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll come up with several uh, variations to consider as we kind of dig more into this. I think Thank we're you. we're envisioning it. You know, is there potentially a retail space or an office space. We want to be flexible and open-minded um, right. in, in that aspect. So council member Chang. I, I like the revision. I like the opening uh, up of that area to, the, to uh, something other than what it was. And I had a question about the first floor layout uh, a couple pages later. Um, basically on that, um, <laughs> Page 15 of 120, oh, I don't know, page 12 of our thing. Um, I noticed that you called out sections for teens and for kids. And I was thinking, do we know that teens are gonna wanna be in one of the most visible spots from the street and maybe they wouldn't wanna be on the water side, but I'm sure that's all adjustable. Um, yeah, that, that process is really driven by the library district and their space planning exercise uh, since the ground floor is primarily uh, library space. Did you have anything to add to that, Mike, in kind of the thinking there? Um, I think we we wanted the we wanted the teen space next to that kind of a walk up window and having a more of like a cafe style. And then when it comes to kids, um, having them kind of enclosed in an area that's a little bit further away from the entrance is what we usually like in less public area. Um, so. I, they could be swapped, you know, um, but it was intentional about keeping the kids kind of further away from the street side. Council member Bond. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> um, can you guys pan back to the GGLO image? I just wanted to talk about a couple of elements on that screen. Um, 
the the view deck that is shown there is not in a location that the city currently controls that's actually on a port of Bremerton DNR lease area and so we are envisioning that deck to likely um, either be part of the existing seawall which we're studying to figure out whether that could be repurposed or if we had to remove the seawall potentially putting the viewing deck further uh, a little bit further to the southwest on the waterfront there um, the mayor touched on the stage, and we should talk about that during our, our uh, grant discussion later on on tonight's agenda, because if we want a stage, we need to put it in our grant application as part of the, the components that we're seeking to design. So hopefully we can talk a little bit more about whether we do or do not want a stage, um, because the grant application uh, that the city is seeking is due on May 3rd. I also want to point out there is a pop-up retail icon on this map, and that that was because we had initially designed a covering on the marina sewer lift station to help screen it from the, the view of the public and from the, the proposed bank building. That has now been proposed for removal and I believe we are moving forward with the marina doing other, um, other design elements that, are, that scale the building size down rather than having that larger overhang. And so that uh, is no longer a feature though you still could have pop-up retail um, within the plaza. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of the elements that were shown in this image. And I will state that, you know, we, we've only seen some very, very preliminary information from the bank, but the, the bank is proposing some ground floor uses that have kind of an indoor outdoor function that tie into this plaza. And so I think that's a really nice feature that we're seeing out of, um, out of their design team that, that plays very nicely with, with the, uh, the concept that we've come up with here. And so, um, this will, I, I think we need to keep all of this in mind as we talk about both the park impact fee issue on tonight's agenda, as well as the grant application issue on tonight's agenda. But in terms of our, our scope of work for these task orders, um, we signed a couple of contract amendments with RFM to both look at Bay Street. And I do have some, some less glamorous civil engineering drawings of what Bay Street is going to look like. And if any of you would like to have those um, drawings, we can certainly email them to you. They're not, they're not real nice to look at in a, a public meeting like this. Um, so we're happy to share those. Um, and then the, the work that KPG is doing on landscape design, I think we're pretty close to wrapping up their um, additional contract scope. So unless there's, there's some major change of direction or feedback here, um, this, this outdoor space design effort is probably going to slow down a little bit until we sort out funding in, in terms of how we are going to fund the design and construction of this overall plaza. And so um, I, I think the mayor has reported previously that we applied for a federal appropriation to help get this done. And then we're, we're putting in this uh, grant with the Recreation Conservation Office for uh, developing the plaza and some waterfront restoration. And then separately, we have applied for funding at KRCC to do the Bay Street uh, project. And so depending on our success with those grants, uh, we will have a clearer funding picture of, of how we are going to get these things designed and uh, ready to go to bid. And then we also have to find the, the, uh, the funding for construction. One other thing to touch on too, uh, it's likely the bank will have some sort of a coffee shop element in their ground floor retail. And we have it in our building too. And if the bank moves forward with that idea, we probably want to revisit not having that, you know, and doing something else with that space within our building. So uh, a lot more, a lot of moving parts, you know, nothing set in stone yet, but I think we've got some really, really good concepts here. Sue, do you have anything to share from the library district side? Um, I don't, I, at this point, um, I have been out of town for a couple of weeks. And so I haven't really even connected with anybody recently to see where things are with this. So um, with this project, but I have in, um, have planned to meet with uh, other, a couple of other people um, in the coming week to figure out where the library is with, with all of this. But these, these, this design and everything just looks so amazing to me and I'm so, so excited about it. Thanks for sharing, Sue. And if you need, uh, you know, slide decks or images or pretty pictures to help in your conversations, we're, we'll be happy to share those with you. So any further questions, comments? We'll move on to the, the next item. Thank you, Dean and Lori and, and Jennifer. I'm sorry that Nick uh, trashed your, the, that your pictures aren't sexy and pretty like everybody else's, but um, you know, it's, it's all okay. right. It's okay.
<laughs> All right. Thank you, Thank guys. You and Sue, if you want to stick around, we're going to talk about our one word survey, too, which uh, relates relates to this project, too. Thanks, everybody. Yep. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, maybe Brandy, could you bring up that uh, the one word survey, just the, the words that we're considering. So we all know that um, I think we're all in love with the community that turns into unity on the, um, the one corner of the building. And so we did some public outreach and, uh, and a survey, and I shared some of those ideas with you. Um, I'm just waiting on Brandy to bring that up. And uh, they're in your packet, but... Uh, Sean, go ahead. You got to. Oh, I was just going to speak to this issue just based on what you had sent out um, earlier. And uh, just the fact that this is, you know, Port Orchard's community center. I, for one, really like the idea of just having Port Orchard on that side of the building as you're coming down Bay Street. I just think it's the, it's the right thing to do. And I think the other words are just a little bit I don't know, cliche can become dated and it just the whole idea of just Port Orchard and the ownership there really resonates with me. Okay. Appreciate it. And, and do you want to you know, honest, honestly, that was the only one that didn't come from the community process. That one was my idea. So. Well, then I changed Jay? my mind. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> never mind. Moving on. <laughs> yeah. So, Jay? Yeah, I... <clears throat> I actually liked any of the ship ideas, friendship or fellowship, since it, uh, that part of the community center, if I had it right, uh, went to the, uh, you know, the uh, seaside. However, uh, I do agree with uh, Councilman Cucciardi there that uh, I did like Port Orchard on the one side because also coming down, uh, you know, from uh, outside that you would see Port Orchard. Port so I can live with any of yeah. those three. Yeah, and and the ILA that will be on next week's should be on next week's agenda. We're actually formally going through the process to change this from the South Kitsap Community Event Center to the Port Orchard Community Event Center. So that that will be the formal name of the of the, of the event center. We had when this process started, we had we thought a bunch of partners, and now it's us and in the library, and uh, so there aren't any. South Kitsap folks, uh, you know, the county or the port uh, involved any longer. So council member Lucarelli. So I also from that list have thought that Port Orchard was the best. Um, Brandy, can you please go back to um, page 20, 19 and 20, just to show how the light is supposed to pass through that and reflect. Um, I'm kind of also still back to event center. Um, there's something very appealing about letting people know what that is all about. If it's were to say Port Orchard, I wonder if people would think that that maybe is where City Hall was or something along that that line. But it is on uh, the the main it's on the main sign on Bay Street. It does call out community event center. Yeah, we'll, we'll have we'll have signage out at the road. That's yeah. for certain. Well. In the way that it shows on the event center reflection and the it says enter. So it's really interesting how the C is reflected in a different place than enter if that were to be the case, if that were actually um, logistically true. And Brand, that was, Brandy, that's kind of fun. It's the next it's the next image, I believe. We want the there we go. That's what do you we're see how do you see how it says enter? Um it shows enter oh. that. It's a I rendering. Just, I don't know that it will really I be know, that. I know. And that's why I said if it were logistically true. But yeah. um, there's, I also think that that in, isn't bad. And I went through all the different ones. Um, it, it's con Those other names were a little confusing. I don't know why we'd put friendship, because I think that would be very confusing, uh, even though I think it's um, kind of a cool idea. So I, I agree with you, Sean. I just... I solicited input from the community. I'm just sharing the input we got from the community. That's, right. That was the that was the the process. So I um, I don't disagree with you guys. The Port Orchard is probably the better choice. Councilor Clausen. 
I was just going to make it unanimous. I think Port Orchard probably said that fits best in, uh, in at least the list that's been provided. Mm -hmm. So to say Port on the front side and then Orchard down the other side, and from this angle, you'd see Port Orchard. So Council Member Chang? I not only like Port Orchard, I think it should actually go where you're having community. That's just my opinion. Yeah, the challenge to that is then unity is is not then we've got just calm on the front on the front face of the building that it was so powerful to have unity calm really doesn't have any meaning if you brandy slide to the other rendering so calm would be on the front on that other corner and it just doesn't doesn't play as well as unity does Right. What, I, what I'm thinking is as you're driving in, you would see port and then orchard instead of just community. So that's why I am just sort of leaning towards port and orchard on that corner. And you could put community maybe on the other one or something else or the water side. I don't know. No, there, are, there aren't any, any wraps on the, on the water side, but um, Council Mayor Trenary? I agree with uh, the majority here. I think if the fault, the next picture um, Port Orchard fits perfectly along that that angle of the building, and I think that's the best fit out of all of these myself. Okay, sounds pretty much unanimous. So let's. Uh, I, I scheduled five minutes or fifteen, and we got this done in about seven. So I didn't think it was just going to be this easy. All right, Mr. Bond, let's. Uh, Let's talk about grant applications because some of these grants are for this project. All right. So um, in your packet, I, I included a staff report and I am um, frantically working on a couple of grant applications right now to the Recreation Conservation Office. Um, one of the applications is being prepared by Public Works and that is for extending non-motorized improvements between McCormick Woods Drive and Old Clifton, or I'm sorry, in McCormick Village Park along Old Clifton Road. And so the, the proposal is to seek $500,000 uh, from RCO and that requires a 50% match. So it's a total uh, of at least a million dollar project to put in that non-motorized non facility. And um, the, the proposed match is either park or transportation impact fees because uh, that project is listed at both in our parks plan and in our transportation improvement program. And so, um, what we have to do tonight and at our next council meeting is for each one of these grant applications, the city council has to approve a resolution basically consenting to uh, the staff person applying for this grant and saying that you understand the terms of the grant. You're not actually signing the grant agreement now. You could still choose not to do that later, um, but, but we wanted to make sure that the council is on board with our three funding requests. So, um, before we move on to the, the second and third grant, is anyone does anyone have any concerns with seeking $500,000 for this project with the understanding that we would have to match it with 500,000 in parks or transportation impact fees? Support it completely. All right. So the second grant application that we are working on is very much related to our, our first presentation on the community event center and the public plazas that sort of tie uh, everything waterward of Bay Street between Frederick and Port Street uh, together. So the, there's a program called the Aquatic Lands Enhancement Account Grant, and it allows for the development of, of active recreation or gathering spaces on the waterfront and also waterfront restoration projects. Um, please ignore the, the cost estimates in my staff report. We've found out uh, since I wrote this report that they're actually gonna be quite a bit higher than this. We are probably looking at about a $4 million uh, price tag to develop the plazas, including our, our engineering uh, A&E cost of preparing bid specs and doing landscape plans and, and design. Um, the problem with this grant is it's only for $500,000 this is the maximum amount. So we would have to spend at least a million, which we should have no problem doing on this project. Um, the reason that we are, we, we sort of have two choices here. We could have either narrowed the scope of our ask and only done the waterfront restoration, waterward of the community center, or only done the plaza. However, 
we have this federal appropriation request into our congressional delegation uh, out of uh, Washington, D.C. And we have asked, Mayor, I don't remember the dollar amount. I think $1 we million. Asked for, uh, I think we asked for a million dollars for, um, for the shoreline restoration piece of this project. And we don't know yet whether we're going to get that. And so we could have narrowed this project to just apply for funding to do shoreline restoration. But then if we get the federal money, we don't have the ability to move the RCL money to some other element of our project. And so by, by asking for the entire plaza from RCO, we're committing ourselves to a higher price tag, but we have more flexibility in terms of where we spend the RCO money. And then we hopefully can match that with uh, this federal appropriation. Um, I think this conversation is very much tied to our park impact fee conversation later tonight. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, we've done some forecasting of, of what development is going to occur over the next four years. We do think that if everything in for permitting right now and that, that we're seeing moving forward gets built, we, we could bring in 10 or $12 million in park impact fee money in that time. And so I don't think matching this grant is going to be a problem unless something really catastrophic happened in the housing market. Um, but it is, it is a big lift for the city if this ends up being the only piece of funding that we get for this project. And we could still ask for other, other funding sources, but I don't know that we're going to get a state appropriation when we've already gotten a $500,000 grant from RCO. So it's, um, it's something that I, I want you guys to weigh the pros and cons of. And then as I mentioned in the earlier presentation, if you guys want a stage included in this, add $50,000 to my $4 million estimate, and I will put it in our grant application request so that um, it's, it's part of our overall project. So Nick, just, I believe though, if the world fell apart on us and, and housing stopped, and the only thing we got was this 500,000 and we didn't get the appropriation and all of a sudden park in fact fees dried up, we could, we could return the grant. We could, we, we, we can choose 500,000, we wouldn't be a you know, be able to do it. So go ahead. Right. So, so we do not have to enter into this agreement. Um, the nice thing about this grant is we will find out the project rankings later this summer, but we don't have funding available to us until midway through 2023. So I think we'll have a good idea of whether we received this money um, in the next four to five months, uh, at five months at the very latest. And it's possible um, that we won't even be asked to sign this agreement until we're into 2023. And so there's a little bit of time to figure out whether the, the parks impact fee revenue is coming in as projected or not. But um, just because this is a, a much higher dollar price tag than our other park projects, I wanted you to consider this carefully. Yeah, I like the larger scope. Jay? Yeah, I like the larger scope too. Um, <clears throat> And thanks all the work you're doing on this, Nick. Um, and if we have time to to wait, I mean, you know, with the signing of the agreement, that's awesome. I always fear about returning money uh, if you don't have it. That that does impact how people view any future applications. So if we do have that grace period, I'm I'm all I'm all for going forward with the larger amount. You know, and. Something to remember too, the bank is very sensitive to, we're building the marina pump station first. We're gonna do some things to try to doll that up a little bit with a grass firm, but they're really concerned that it, they build their building. And if it's you know, a long time until the plaza gets built, um, they're not gonna be comfortable with that scenario. So we've got, we gotta find ways to, to rebuild Bay Street and, and these plazas are so important, you know, the front door is Bay Street and this plaza is really the side yards, you know, and, and the, the community space that's going to activate these two, you know, the community center and, and what's going on at the bank. And so it's really important, I think, that these, these grants that, and then projects that they move forward timely. So Cindy, go ahead. I like the larger scope as well. And I think we should include the stage. Okay, John. Cindy took the words right out of my mouth. I agree with her. Okay, everybody else comfortable with throwing a little stage in there too? Okay. Yeah, I'm All fine right. with the stage. I'm I'm really concerned about that added added cost. So I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about the the parks program 
a little later in the meeting here. Fair All enough. Right. Um, so the third grant application um, was, was a little bit of a last minute project and we had um, one of the best presentations I've ever seen a, a member of the public give to a, in a, a body. Um, a young man named Isaac Wynn came to the planning commission in March and provided testimony about the parks plan and said that he and he and his friends would really like to have a futsal court in Port Orchard. He brought a petition that was signed by I think 200 plus uh, other students in our area and uh, made the pitch to the planning commission that we should look for opportunities to, to provide a futsal court and that very frequently cities that put these in, they combine a basketball court and a futsal court in one so that there are goals underneath the basketball hoop and it's a fenced area of a similar dimension on a sport court. And so we looked at opportunities um, based on our existing facilities to see if there was any grant opportunities or, or facilities that needed improvement. And the mayor suggested that the basketball court at Gibbons Park uh, or Gibbons Fields uh, could use rehabilitation. And so we thought that this would be an excellent opportunity for a very small dollar grant um, to refurbish that field. We also started looking at the adjacent tennis courts and realizing that they could be resurfaced and converted for both pickleball and uh, tennis use. And so we've put together a very small grant application under the youth athletic facilities category from the Recreation Conservation Office. We're estimating the total project cost for both projects, the futsal basketball rehab and the tennis court pickleball project to be about $310,000. That would require $155,000 of city park impact fee money. And then we would get $155,000 from the RCO. And so this one doesn't require presentations or PowerPoints. It's, it's just a, uh, it's in a, a category where it's, um, you fill out the application form and you generally are successful. So this is the third request we would put in. Obviously it takes away a little bit of money that would be available for the plaza if we needed it. But um, I think it's a worthwhile project and, um, you know, futsal courts are, are not super common in the Northwest. There's a few in Seattle. There's a few indoor ones around the area that you have to pay to use. But in terms of an outdoor futsal court in a public park, uh, there, there's nothing as far as I can tell on this side of the water. So it would be a, a first of its kind facility. And I think it would be a, a good draw. And the, and the other element to this, the pickleball tennis court resurfacing, we have gotten so much use out of Van Z's. I mean, I, you know, we get some tennis players, but I, three nights a week, there's people out playing on that pickleball court. It's really, really popular. So Council member Cacciardi. Yeah. I just, I just like the, these three different options because we're, we're spreading out our resources across our city. You know, this, this, this third proposal here is in an area that really needs some improvements. And, uh, and honestly, to, to your point, uh, mayor, I, I think that you could almost maybe just stripe these as pickleball courts. I just think that the demand that's out there with pickleball, um, just to avoid some of that confusion and avoid some of that conflict might not be a bad, bad thing to, to, to look at. But I just I just like the fact that we're trying to, you know, look at our entire city and not just focused on, on one area. So this is this is great. Councilmember uh, Clausen. Yeah, I was going to say something similar other than I think you should keep the the courts that have multi-use, you could do pickleball or tennis. Uh, and I agree with you, Mayor. I've noticed that the uh, courts at Van Z have been very well utilized for pickleball. So, uh, there's lots of folks that are there uh, frequently taking advantage of that. And I agree with Sean, it's, it's nice. Uh, that area does need some improvement. It happens to be close to my home, so I drive by it all the time and see it. So it certainly can use some refurbishing. Yep, it's, it's tired equipment there, that's for certain. Yep. Council Member Ternary. Yeah, I think this is a great use of, of uh, funds and spreads the wealth amongst our city. Uh, I've played on those tennis courts and that basketball court and it's time for them to be resurfaced. But uh, more importantly than that, the number one uh, response we heard on our park survey was we need more pickleball cart courts in this area and this would help address that. Um, I do think we should uh, stripe them for both uh, making more multi-purpose just in case but I think this is a, an awesome opportunity and suggestion here. Councilmember Lucarelli. 
I too am supporting this. I think it's pretty exciting. Um, for minimal investment, I think we can draw quite a few more people into that area. Um, and that's never a bad thing to have a, a park utilized more um, with such diverse games. So I'm, I think it's wonderful. Pickleball, by the way, yeah. Pickleball stripes are great. <laughs> Sean, did you have another comment? Nope. And Mark, you get your hand raised too. Do you have another comment? Or? Sorry about that. It's okay. And, and, and so, I would just add concerning the, the tennis versus pickleball, this is a youth athletic facility category grant. And I believe that most of our pickleball players are probably not in the youth category. And so by making it a more versatile uh, facility, I think we probably are meeting the criteria a little bit better for that program. Yeah. Good comment. So Sue, you're welcome to hang around with us all night, but you don't have to. If you've got other things to do this evening, we're, we're going to talk about exciting stuff like uh, development fees and stuff, stuff next. So. so other comments about the grants? Sounds like everybody's supportive of all three and uh, we've got an idea how to pay for it all. So that's next. Or, yep. All right, so let's move on to item four, Nick. All right, item four, this is uh, the painful part of the conversation because we have to figure out how to pay for all of these improvements in terms of our share. Um, the city currently imposes park impact fees on all residential development in the city. Our, our current fee schedule was adopted in 2011 and does not have an automatic CPI adjustment and has not been touched since 2011. The, the fees are $811 per single family home and $584 per multifamily home. Earlier this year, the city finished work on its parks, recreation, and open space plan. And as part of the update, our consultant provided a updated capital improvement program and an impact fee study. The, the pros plan called for a six-year investment of $20 million in new park facilities and a 20-year investment of $68.9 million in new park facilities. These investments are necessary to maintain existing levels of service for city parks based on our population growth that is expected. The parks plan identifies park impact fees as a major component of the city's funding strategy. And the, Beck, uh, the Beckwith Group, our consultant, suggested uh, a fee schedule that assumes that 50% of the capital cost of the city's park system be funded with impact fees. Um, the proposed fee schedule is based on average occupancy. And so each different building type in the city has a different persons per household number. And um, for single family homes, it's, it's an average of 2.84 people. And for multifamily units, it's, it's close to two people per household. And so you take the, uh, the park impact fee um, level of service standard and you multiply it by the persons per household number to determine how much each new dwelling uh, would pay as an impact fee. If we were to assess, um, um, and I'm sorry, the, the cost of maintaining level of service per resident in the city is about $3,349. And so when you multiply that um, by, by point uh, or 2.84, that gives you the number that it would cost per home if we were to assess 100% of the the cost of expanding our park system to new development, but the consultant has advised us that you do not want, legally speaking, you need to be below 100% uh, of, of the cost of your park system as, as being funded by development. So he said you can really be anywhere from zero to 99%. He recommends a target of 50, but if the city council felt that by looking at comparable jurisdictions or what what seems reasonable for new development to pay, you could adjust that you know, downward to 30%, upward to 70% or, or any number um, in between. And so in the packet that, that was provided tonight, we included a table that, that basically broke down our, our ELOS number per, per person based on unit type. And then we set it at, at the 30%, 40%, 50%, and 60% funding threshold. And so at 50%, um, the, the rate for a single family dwelling um, ends up being about $4,700. And that is significantly higher than any of our neighboring jurisdictions. And so we provided a comparison that included Paulsbo at 1100, um, uh, Gig Harbor uh, at, at 491, or I'm sorry, at, at 1500, 
um, per residential unit. Pierce County is at $2,700 per unit. And so at 50%, we're already higher than our, our neighbors, but that is also the cost of, of us really maintaining the level of service that we enjoy today as the city continues to grow. And so the, the city council, um, the, the request tonight is that the city council discuss the alternative rates, uh, determine whether you want to assess, uh, which percentage you want to assess to new development of our parks program. And then we will be bringing forward a park impact fee ordinance um, with our comprehensive plan adoption ordinance likely on at our first meeting of June. And so I, with that, I will turn it over to the council for discussion in terms of where this rate should be set. And I'd just like to open with, I think it is so important. We have tremendous growth pressures happening in our community. And we have so many exciting projects that we're about to do or want to do. And, and from, you know, the Bay Street path, well, we've got the right-of-way portion of it uh, funded. We still have, I believe that it's going to cost more than the connecting Washington dollars we have that we're going to need to come up with a couple million dollars. We've got the community center where you need to raise about $8 million. We've got the plazas that we've talked about, the shoreline restoration and the, the, all the different grants that we just talked about. We can easily spend $20 million in the next six years in a blink of an eye and all and, and fund these projects that are so important to the quality of life in our community. I, I would advocate going north of the 50% and possibly even going to 70, 70%, which is about $6,000. But I'll let you guys discuss that at this point. Council Member Cachardi. Yeah, that's a good segue, Mary. You kind of stole some of my words. Um, you know, we hear all the time about, you know, just the tremendous amount of development in our community. Some people like it. Some people don't like it. They would, there's, you know, part of our community that just says, we don't want to grow. We don't want to, you know, do anything more. Um, you know, we understand what's, you know, what's our obligations um, with the UGA. And, and I would rather do it right. Let's build out our community right and not take the cheap road. I think, you know, Port Orchard, perhaps in the past has, has been one of the cities that maybe looked to take the cheap road a little bit. And uh, we have a one time, right? The, this, this, is, this is a one time opportunity. And, and I would just hate to get five or 10 years down the road and regret not doing a little bit more. Um, you know, if you take the difference between $2,800, $4,800, you know, $6,800, you know, over the course of five, 10 years worth of appreciation of some of these homes, I think it's a little bit de minimis, but I think what we get in return is something that's just far superior. And so I'm less concerned about what our neighboring jurisdictions are doing, but I, I like the idea that we are, and we have been for years now, as we've you know, looked at all of these different uh, master plans and some sub area plans to do things right. And so I'm absolutely in favor in, in, in more than less. So I would, I would not be offended by going to that full 70%. Thank you for that. Council member Rosa Pepe. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Sean, because I totally agree with what you're saying. Uh, one of the things that I've said before is that I don't like, um, I think people coming in should be paying their fair share. Um, I would love for us to, at one time or another, move forward with a, uh, a park district uh, where we could do that, but that's not where we're at right now. And so I'm, you know, whether it's 50, 60, 70%, I'm all in favor of increasing the impact fees uh, to cover uh, the needs of the community as it grows. Council Member Claussen. Yeah, I'm, you know, I certainly understand what's being said here. Um, and I understand that growth should pay for growth, but some of the projects that you're suggesting there are not growth related. They're just enhancements to the overall community. Um, and we're putting a significant amount on the backs of, of new development. When you look at these by themselves, um, they don't sound bad, but I guess my concern, and I don't have it in front of me, is when you put this impact fee with the rest of the impact fees that we've done, pretty soon you're talking about some real numbers 
And those real numbers are adding significantly to the cost of housing, um, which, you know, has, has an impact there. So I guess, you know, generally speaking, I'm supportive, but I'd sure like to see what the total impact would be when you add all of these impact fees together, just so we can kind of put it in perspective with how much are we adding to the cost of a new home. Yeah. And I believe I, in the last couple of weeks, I sent you all a, uh, a spreadsheet that showed all, showed all of those. And uh, the imp impact fees are, there, there's a difference between connection charges, which are the, uh, a different animal than, than the impact fees. And in the impact fees, we've got schools, which are less than a thousand, I believe, Nick, or right around a thousand. Uh, we've got our traffic impact fee, which is north of 5,000, I think. 5,200 on traffic. I think it's 1,300 on schools for single family and 800 or so for multifamily. Yeah. So we only really, this, this is, we only have three impact fees. Schools, 1,300, 5,200, uh, Nick stated for traffic impact fees and our parks that are woefully inadequate right now. And uh, so we're adding, if we, we went the 70% route, we're talking $12,000 onto a cost of a house and, and greatly enhancing, I, I believe, the quality of life in our community because this is affecting our community, the growth. Well, it is. I wouldn't argue with you on that side of it, but, you know, you still have to look, I think you need to look at the connection fees as well, because that's a cost of building the permit fees that we talked about tonight at the, at the finance committee. Uh, you know, it, it just adds up, but, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to adding to the park impact fees. I'm not quite sure that I'm ready for the 70% yet, but conceptually I'm, in favor of it. Okay. Council member Trenary. Yeah, I tend to side with John on this. I'm a little more conservative when it comes to, to looking at these impact fees. Naturally, I don't want to see our current citizens pay for uh, this type of, of uh, improvements uh, as, as little as we can, uh, keep them from having to pay this burden. But at the same time, you know, one of our major concerns in, in not only our town, but all over Kitsap County is affordable housing. And we are definitely uh, looking at adding some increase to that affordable housing. Uh, so I'm kind of torn with this right at this point, but, but uh, currently I, I tend to shy away from that higher end of this scale at this moment. And, you know, and I, I hear you on the affordable housing element, but we do have tools in place and some developers are taking advantage of that in our multifamily uh, tax abatement, you know, the property tax abatement. So Council Member Cacciardi, and then I'll go back to Council Member yeah, Riley. Just to reiterate, reiterate a couple of points, and, and I think the affordable housing issue is independent of this particular issue. Um, if you look at, you know, where our growth is occurring, um, you know, just look at the west side of, of our of our city, literally thousands of homes that are that are being built over the last few years and, and coming into the over the next five years, should our economy stay where it's at today. Um, and, and the difference between a three thousand dollar fee and, a, and an eight thousand dollar fee or seven thousand dollar fee it just it just doesn't change the conversation. We're still more affordable than surrounding communities, and so I would hate for us to lose the opportunity to generate the the revenue that we can actually move the needle with parks. Now, to your point, Mark and, and John, affordable housing is critically important, and I think it's a it's a different conversation, and we've identified different tools for that. But I just would hate for us to wait on, on, on maybe being a little bit more aggressive on this issue. And all of a sudden, five years goes by and 1,500 new units get built and we've missed out on literally millions of dollars. I, I think those, those conversations are, are, are they're just they're different. Um, so, again, definitely more in favor of a higher fee than a lower fee. Okay. Councilmember Liccarelli. So where does the remaining 30 or 40% come from? Our citizens, our general fund. And grants. And grants. I, I, 
I'm definitely in favor of all these improvements, but I think we have to be awfully careful of how much we bite off at once. And I guess given all of that, I'm in favor of having the higher impact fee. I'm wondering when this would become effective. And then- well, I, I think that's one of the uh, items that I'd like feedback on is, is an effective date and also what sort of public process would you like to, to have in terms of hearings or public meetings between now and when this gets considered. Um, I would propose that we, we would need at least 30 days to roll this out and maybe more. But um, I, I think that by July 1st, uh, maybe August 1st, this could definitely be in effect and we could um, start assessing the fee. So would that mean that anybody who has a project um, in the works, even in the very beginning stages, if they've contacted the city, they would be exempt from this? At what point would, would it have to be an entirely new project to- When, when you pull your permit is when you best. Yeah, so you, you could give more time. I think we did that when we updated the traffic impact fees, where we said if you had an application in prior to March 1st, you would be you would pay the old rate provided you picked up your permit by a certain date. So we could insert language into the ordinance that that had that sort of effect. Um, I, I think that you know that was a little bit complicated for our admin staff to sort through. My preference yeah. would be if if you want to delay it, let's just give it 60 days and and put pressure on people to make the revisions to their plans and get their permits picked up. Yeah. The, the other rub to that, you know, phased or delayed implementation or grandfathering projects is, is it causes a rush, you know, and we're already, mm-hmm. you know, extremely busy and to, to cause, you know, a, a rush of new applications <laughs> artificially is, is probably not a desired effect. So council member Chang. Yeah, th- I thank Cindy for asking that question because I wonder, for example, how soon this could go into effect. And of all the number of all the developments that we've heard in the pipeline, how many of them might be affected? So, so that's a concern, and I know we don't have a more specific answer. But I'm also thinking that um, taken alone, um, the numbers that we're talking about just look ridiculous compared to our um, neighbors. Um, however, I think what we should and I'm sure what we would be looking at is the total impact fees in all the different areas. And what does that compare to? Because, and I, I think we've been certainly under, um, under the market at our current rates for, for too long. And so part of it may be that we have a backlog, but it, it seems like quite a jump, for example, from 1100 to 6,700. Um, I, I agree with with Sean though that I think it's something that's certainly necessary. It's just I'm not sure how it could be palatable when you think of all the other places that people might want to build. Yeah, I, I'm not afraid of losing a little bit of business. Mm-hmm. No, for real. Still below our surrounding communities, gang and. And again, we're in a unique time with real estate, but it, it's been unbelievable to see what, you know, these new builds were selling for two years ago and the same exact models are selling for today. Um, I just, I think it's short-sighted for us to be concerned over $2,000, right? We can always come back off of this. If the economy changes, it might, but I would rather, you know, it's been so long since our community and other communities have addressed issues like this, that to, to, to reset it now and then get into kind of a cost of living adjustment going on so we can keep up. But, you know, the reason why we're seeing big jumps like this is because we've never done this before and our other communities haven't done it either. And so if we want to, you know, protect, I think the integrity of our, of our overall communities moving forward, to me, this seems like the right thing to do to, to be, to err on the high side. Council member Rosa Pepe. It's the second time I got to follow Sean. So uh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, we're, uh, you know, I actually commend the council for over the four years I've been on it to address fees and keeping up with what we want to provide our citizens. And it, it costs money to do that. And I think we'd be short-sighted if we don't try to keep our fees and, uh, commiserate with our growth. It's important to provide these services. And I mean, McCormick Woods Park is is amazing the usage out of there all the time van z i drive by there too john and and other folks it's amazing how it's being used so 
we have to decide on the amount, but we're moving forward with our impact fees and we need to. So thank you. Cindy, go ahead. So just one last thing too is for sure, if we're moving forward with something like this, we'll have to have um, a campaign to let people know what we're planning to do with it and to um, guarantee that anything collected is certainly going to be used for what we say it's going to be used for and not be able to roll into some other funding. Because I think that's what the public is mostly concerned with. We just have to let people know for sure. Yeah, I don't think that's a, a concern because this is development paying for development, but and these impact fees can only be used. They're, these are restricted funds. They can only be used for it, for these projects. So, right. the, and, and that's that was the park plan. That la- the park plan laid out all of the projects. And you know, I li- just off back a napkin. I listed twenty million dollars worth of things that I know we can do in the next six years. And and they're dynamite things like that. That you know, the biggest one is that that plaza and the pathway, you know, you know, continuing the pathway out to Annapolis and having a similar multimodal pathway out to connecting to our parks in McCormick Woods. Those are all vitally, vital amenities, I think, for quality of life. Council Member Trenary. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, Nick, if I could, to please help me clarify for me and understand, help me understand We've got permits in the in the pipeline right now that are pre-approvals. Are these permits going to be uh, susceptible to this change, or where where was that cutting going to take place, Nick? Yeah, so this applies at the time of building permit issuance, and what you do not vest to impact fees. So if if you haven't picked up your permit by the time the new fee takes effect you pay the new fee. If you've picked it up and are actively constructing, then you, um, then, then you are in under the old fee structure. Yeah. So what I would recommend is that we, we're going to have a a process that it's a minimum of 30, if not 60 days. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have a bright line date somewhere out there, another 30 or 60 days we're not going to do this in a vacuum and people need to come in and get their permits by that date. Cause at that date, which is probably going to be no sooner than 90 days from, you know, now could be even a little bit longer than that before we implement this. I mean, that, that, those th- dates can be massaged and um, you know, I, we're going to start a public process here for, with this and maybe it's got a range to it. Maybe it's, somewhere in the 50 to 70 range. You know, I'm, I'm hearing everybody saying we need to do this. It's just how much. And uh, I think 70 is about the top end. And I don't, I haven't heard anybody think we should be, you know, if if you do feel we need to be a little 50%, you know, speak up. And I've got a couple of hands raised here. So John. Yeah, I guess I'm just a little curious as to the public process. Um, the folks that are going to be impacted by this are going to be developers. Right. Uh, everyone else, I think, is going to be go forward and do this. It doesn't cost me anything. So, sure, put it on somebody else's back. So, I'm not quite sure that what the public process is going to do for us. Um, and, you know, I'm not opposed to increasing the fees by any means. It's just more of how far do we go? And, Sean, I think you raised some very good points that. We're in a very unique situation now with the growth that's occurring in the region, let alone our city. And there's an awful lot of it being concentrated here. But we will certainly be at the leader of the pack if we go up to 70 percent. When you look at even what Pierce County is uh, imposing, which is the highest of the list that you provide us is only twenty seven hundred bucks. So. It's, it's going to be pretty unique if we went up to that level. I, I don't know. I, I, those of us have been on in our local government for a number of years, and, and myself included. The Port Orchard wasn't always thought of the way that it is today. And uh, um, I know when I attend things countywide or even in the region, and, and even some of my peers in the state, um, they look up to us. And... Uh, 
I'm pretty proud of that. You know, we're doing amazing things here and it's not, you know, it's all of us, staff included, and, and we should be very proud of that and very proud of the, the projects that, that we're bringing forward. And this is just one of the tools we need to, to make this a, an amazing place. So Nick. Yeah, um, Council Member Lucarelli, you mentioned just communicating to the public about what projects are gonna be built with this. And in, in the staff report, when we reviewed the Parks Plan at January work study, we included a partial list, uh, which I just wanted to mention these parks to, to jog everyone's memory. Um, and I, I think we could certainly include this information in the staff report for a public hearing. Um, and the parks plan, one of the flaws maybe with the capital facilities element is it lists the, the individual improvements, picnic tables at such and such park, rather than giving you a, a really comprehensive understanding of, of the, the, the major park projects. Um, but the Community Event Center includes uh, funding from park impact fees. McCormick Village Park Phase 3, the, the east entrance to McCormick Village Park. Um, the Ruby Creek Regional Park along both sides of Ruby Creek and near the, the future park and ride for Kitsap Transit, which I actually think may be a really good candidate for a grant application in the 2024 cycle um, at the same time that the transit is hopefully developing their park and ride. Um, waterfront park expansion, uh, that's the, the, on the port end of, of downtown, um, where the, the existing stage and playgrounds are, um, that would be building a splash pad and, and enhance, enlarging that out into the parking area. Etta Turner park expansion on the west side of Blackjack Creek, um, the downtown streetscape improvements. So, so all of the, the pedestrian environment downtown is part of our park system. Uh, and then that stormwater park out in Fireweed, which is going to be both a recreation park, but also a stormwater facility for allowing us to put in sidewalks in that whole neighborhood. Those are those are, five, are uh, seven major projects that are able to be funded with park impact fees. I was also going to mention that, you know, the 50, 70 percent discussion, RCO is a, a tremendous resource for grant funding and all of the grant programs they have are a 50% match. And we're not gonna get grants for everything, but I think um, getting setting this at 50% is kind of a floor because we can always backfill the rest of that cost with RCO money if we were patient and waited for RCO to come through. I think there are some projects that are gonna have a schedule that is, is faster than what we can apply for at RCO or um, the dollar, the chunks of money that we would like to apply for at any one time are going to be too large. And so I think the justification for going higher is that RCO um, as a program can get us some matching funds, but not, not enough to fully fund these projects. And, and so it would either take an, an additional local contribution or a larger share of park impact fee money. So I think the next step is we're going to have a public hearing. And, and start a process and then, you know, settle on a do the exact dollar amount. I, I, and so probably Nick, what do you think from a timeline bringing that, starting that next month? Well, why don't we, um, why don't we schedule a hearing for the second meeting of May? Because the earliest we can even adopt the park impact fee is the first meeting of June. We will advertise it um, in plenty of, with plenty of advance notice. And I think in the draft ordinance that we publicly post online, we should probably set an August 1st date as, as the effective date for the new fee, because that's going to be, um, you know, closer to the, I, I guess that would be 60 days, uh, more, almost 60 days from the date of adoption. And because we're talking about it and putting out a notice now, people are going to know 90 or 120 days uh, prior to that actually taking effect that it's being considered and they need to move quickly. So I, I would suggest August 1st for the effective date, the hearing on, uh, looking at my calendar here, May, Last in May. Yeah. Yeah, May 24th um, for a hearing and then possible action on June 14th. Does that seem reasonable? And then I, I guess in terms of publishing the ordinance or making it available ahead of time, I, I need to pick one of these numbers to plug in as a placeholder, um, presumably, or, or would you like me to have three alternatives and, and just leave the ordinances, you know, uh, I think it's 30, 
30 or 4,700, 5,700 or the 6,600 number, and then highlight that as being, you know, the council needs to choose one of these. I, I'd advocate to narrow it to two, you know, the 50 and the 70, but I'm open to other thoughts. Maybe it's 50, 60, or 70. 60 or 70. 60 or 70. Okay. I, I see with that. Yep. Okay. Okay. I think I heard four saying 60 or 70. John, okay. you your comment. Go ahead, Mark. You know, we're, if we're, if we're going to, going to sit at 60 or 70, uh, I'll go back to what Sean said and then reiterate actually what you said too, Mayor. Um, you know, the difference there is what, 800, 800 900 bucks? Um, I, could be, I could be swayed to go to that 70 level and we can always move back down from that, can we? Yeah, absolutely. Can we absolutely. 70. Okay, I'm hearing, one, two, Jay, you said 70, so. Okay. Mark raised a good point. I'd go 70. Yeah. We'll start at 70. And if everybody will be in, in person by then. So if we get pitchforks in the council chambers, we know we went too high. Only from the developers. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. We get the All same right. pitchforks, whether it's 30 or 70 gang. <laughs> <laughs> and they're still going to build homes and they're still going to sell in today's, in today's uh, yeah. environment. That's right. Cindy, go ahead. I, I do think, though, that it's really important to show progress quickly in some area and also to um, educate everyone, um, put a lot of effort into explaining what this is going to be used for and how soon we're going to be able to see some kind of um, result from this. I think yeah. that's pretty important. I think two of those are grants that we're applying for if we were two of the, I mean, the community center and the, and the plaza, those, those are, you know, three or four years out, you know, but the pathway, I hope we're in construction a year from now, you know, but there's some things beyond our control, but the multimodal pathway on old Clifton and the, the tennis court project uh, with pickleball courts, those could be done next year. I mean, the signage by those projects should should show that these are impact fees, working for you kind of thing. Okay. And, and I would add, um, just as an FYI for the council, um, we are talking to McCormick communities about the McCormick Village Park uh, West entrance. And so we have discussed with them the possibility of having them make those improvements for the city in exchange for a park impact fee credit. And so it's possible they're out there mobilized right now. And if we could get an agreement in place, which we're, we're currently discussing with them, it's possible we could have that park improvement done in the next uh, uh, nine months, nine to 15 months, probably. And that's about a half a million dollar improvement to add uh, entrances, signage, and uh, parking, very much needed parking. Taking Port Orchard to a whole new level. That's, that's what we're trying to do. All right, we're uh, on to fee resolution update. And this was discussed tonight at the finance committee. So take it away, Nick. All right, so um, before the council tonight is a proposed fee resolution. Um, Historically, the city has updated this about uh, once every year. Um, this, this last version of our fee resolution goes back to 2020. So it's been about two years since we have um, revised the document. Um, this is the, the fee schedule that establishes permitting fees for building permits, plumbing, mechanical, uh, fire review, public works permits, land use permits, subdivisions, hearing examiner fees. Uh, and there's all sorts of other policies in, in the document. Um, one of the, the main fees that the city charges development is the cost of building permits. And building permits, if you look at the, the red line version of, fee, of the fee resolution, um, table one, uh, you'll notice is unchanged. And that's 
that is you take the assessed, the, the building valuation and you plug it into a formula to determine how much your building permit fee is and how much your plan review fee is. However, building valuations are based off of a ICC, that's the International Code Council, building valuation table that gets updated every six months. And, and that table is a statistical table that looks at construction costs per square foot across every construction category and, and tries to keep up with inflationary uh, considerations. And obviously in the last two years, we've seen a whole lot of inflation in the, uh, the, the world of building. And so we're, we're falling a little bit behind in terms, of, um, in terms of the fees that we charge relative to our costs with uh, COLAs and our high usage of consultants because we, we only have two staff building inspectors and we are, uh, I think I, I reported last meeting that we've spent about 340,000 since January 1st of 2021 on, on building consultants. So um, the, one of the biggest changes to the proposed fee resolution is the adoption of the February 2022 ICC building valuation table. There is a, a comparison document in the packet that shows the impact on, an, on a building permit for a 2,000 square foot house. It is, it is sizable. It's about $600 in additional cost as a result of adopting this new valuation table. Um, but as was mentioned, there, the costs of actually inspecting and doing plan review have, have been climbing um, at the same time that, that construction costs have. And if any of you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to stop me. Um, another big amendment, um, when we went into the pandemic, we started seeing a huge increase in electronic submittals. And unfortunately, our code says that permit uh, fees have to be paid at the time that they submit the application in order for there to be a complete application. Of course, when people are emailing in permit submittals, they can either call and pay with a credit card and, and there's a 3% charge to use a credit card at the city, or they can mail a check. And so sometimes we are getting submittals uh, via email that are followed up with a check several days later, depending on how quickly the post office can get that to us. So we're clarifying the fee resolution to sort of recognize this new um, electronic submittal world that we are living in. And um, this just gives us a little bit more flexibility on electronic submittals so that we're not kicking out applications because the mail is slow or because a check doesn't get here quite as fast as it, as it should. Um, other changes include adoption of hourly rates for staff members. And this is something we work with the finance department to, to make sure that for those charges where we, you know, if somebody has an issued building permit and decides to make substantial revisions to their plans, we don't charge them the entire plan review fee. We actually charge an hourly rate, but we had just one flat rate for all employees, regardless of their salary. And so we are now stratifying that so that each employee, if it's a clerk, it's a lower amount. If it's an engineer, it's a, a higher amount. And, um, and so that is now reflected in the, uh, the fee schedule. Another big change that is in the fee resolution is that we took over fire code responsibilities from South Kitsap Fire and Rescue. And so previously, the interlocal agreement allowed the fire district to charge fees, and they didn't. Um, and, and now that we are taking on this responsibility, each fire permit that comes in, um, currently, we don't have an adopted fee schedule for that. And so we are, are putting that fee schedule in the code. And like building permits, fire permits are based on the valuation of the fire system being installed, whether it's an alarm or a fire sprinkler system. And so there is now a table dealing with those fire permit fees. We're also updating our city refund policy. The, the old policy was very short and um, essentially said that, that if you seek a refund after you've submitted a permit, we any time that has been spent on the permit gets deducted and we'll ref, refund you any remainder based on our hourly rates. Um, we have made this policy more nuanced. We have explicitly stated uh, certain things that can't be refunded, such as technology fees, which is the, the, the fee that we charge for our permit system when we input information into the system and, and get everything set up for processing. And so um, there's, there's just a little bit more robust policy um, that is more nuanced on, on refunds. And then finally, um, we use third-party consultants I mentioned for building and fire, and we've been relying on them heavily in recent years. We also have third-party consultants that do things like geotechnical review, traffic review, and critical areas review. Our, our process and our fee structure for these two areas are very different. And so you will see two new sections in the fee resolution in the red line copy. Um, I think it is 
on page, uh, I'm scrolling there right now. Um, it's on page 68 of your packet and 69 of the packet. And um, for, the, for the traffic wetland um, geotechnical consultants, we had been charging deposits where somebody had to pay a deposit and we would get the review going. And then if, if they were under, they would get a, a refund. If they were over, they would have to pay the difference in cost. Um, tracking deposits is, is really not something that's ideal for our finance department or our clerical staff. And we've been working with our consultants. They are now able to give us much more accurate cost estimates for what their service is going to cost before we ask them to start reviewing. And so, for instance, if we have a traffic report that needs to be reviewed, we will email that report to TSI, our traffic consultant. They will send back a task order that says to review this plan, we're going to charge you, you know, $3,900. And we just bill that directly to the applicant rather than, than having to manage this whole deposit structure. So we're streamlining and kind of making a process improvement in terms of how we handle uh, third-party consultants for for, for those situations. Our, our building consultants are a little bit different because their fee structure is based on the overall permit fee that the city charges. Um, if, if a building permit is $100, the plan review fee is always 66% of the building permit fee. So in that case, $66. What the our consultants charge us, and this is the same for all of our consultants, is 55% of the building permit fee is what they charge us to do plan review um, for the city. And that does not include our civil engineer or our planners doing design review to verify that the plans are in accordance with land use codes and our engineering standards. And so most of the time, the plan review fee that we are collecting is covering the cost for us to send those plans out for review. However, if we get into a situation where you're going through a third or fourth set of revisions, we are putting in the fee resolution that those extra revisions um, will be billed at an hourly rate. Uh, and then the hourly rate is listed. Um, likewise, for really complex projects, which we're defining as exceeding $10 million in valuation. And so, you know, most of your apartment buildings like out at Haven aren't, you know, there's 13 buildings and the total project is certainly over $10 million, but each individual building is not. Um, so those types of buildings, they just pay the, the standard fee structure, but for a mixed use project, for a courthouse project, those plan review fees could get really expensive and they don't fit as squarely into this 55% of the total permit fee rule. And so we wanna make sure that we are made whole when we're reviewing those really complex projects. And so if the city's base fee isn't enough, we would then charge, uh, we would charge essentially the actual cost of plan review to those applicants um, to, to make sure that we are covering our cost of, of having a consultant do that work. So I think that's um, a pretty good uh, recap of what's in the fee resolution. Um, there was some, some minor cleanup that our attorneys had recommended that we, we make and a few typos here and there and minor adjustments to fees, but all in all, um, those are the high points and I'm happy to take any questions. Go ahead, John. Yes, Mayor, I just wanted to share with the rest of the council, you just heard a good portion of the finance committee meeting. Uh, the finance committee listened to this uh, in detail and uh, essentially the three of us on the committee were supportive of this moving forward. So I just wanted to share that. Mark? Yeah, Nick, how, uh, how are these uh, new fees compared to, for example, Gig Harbor or the county fees, charge fees, are we in line with those current or? Well, we so when we adopted our fee resolution in 2020, we actually had amended table one for building permit fees uh, to largely match the Gig Harbor fee structure. And we ran a couple of test cases through where we looked at a, you know, what is, uh, what we realized is that the higher value the project the, the less likely the fee was going to be able to cover our actual cost. And when we looked at Gig Harbor's model, the math seemed to work in terms of what a consultant would cost us to review something like uh, a county courthouse building. So, so the, the basic framework for building permits is very similar to our neighbors. The, I don't know whether they've adopted the February 2022 building valuation tables yet. Those only came out at, in early March. And so uh, if they haven't done it yet, most of them do update that valuation table fairly regularly. Um, for other permits, 
you know, the, the permit types that we have, like our public works permits are, are structured differently than the county or Gig Harbor. So it's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, I think that we look at our actual cost and our time involved and who has to review certain things um, as, as part of setting our fee. And for instance, our land disturbing activity permits, um, that is a civil plan review for all of the site improvements when you're doing a, like a subdivision or an apartment complex. So there's water systems there, there's sewer systems there, stormwater, uh, pavement, sidewalks, landscaping, it all gets lumped into one um, permit. Um, comparing to other jurisdictions, some of them have utility districts that handle certain pieces of that review. And so it's, it's really hard to do a comparison because everybody's uh, infrastructure and, and you know, how, how different departments are siloed is, is a little bit different depending on where you are. Okay, thanks. And one other question. Did you do a, did we do a basic flat percentage increase across the board or did we really get, get into the, into the details here and, and go at our costs, actual costs for each one of these things? No. And, and actually we only, if you look at the tables in the red line version, you know, all the changes are, are highlighted in red. And so the vast majority of permit fees listed here are not changing. Um, there's a handful of land use permits. There were a few like critical areas reviews that we actually hadn't adopted a fee for. And like I said, the fire, the fire fees are all brand new. So that's all right. in red line, but most of these fees are not changing. It's mainly the valuation table and the policies and, and issues I described that are just summarized in the staff report. All right. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, these fees aren't designed to be a revenue source to go into the general fund and they can't be. It's it, We need to cover the cost of the consultants, third-party consultants that are doing this body of work and cover the you know, DC, DD, you know, DCD's operation with the exception of code enforcement and one other, one other aspect to it. Long-range planning is Long -range not supposed planning. to be funded by permits. Yeah, Everything else needs to come from this source of dollars and it, and it can't we can't charge more than that and and be shifting it to our general fund it wouldn't it wouldn't be appropriate or, or legal other questions for nick so our, right. our intent with this is to take it forward to you for a vote next week and so i just want to make sure that everyone is comfortable with that uh, going forward all right thank you very much All right, now we're on to the police chief. He's gonna talk about body-worn cameras. Hey, thank you. Um, got a presentation, should be fairly short and then we'll have some time for questions. So um, I don't know if Brandy or Janine has that and can pull it up or uh, allow me to take control. I can also try and just get it off of mine. Yep, I'll pull it up here in just a second. Thank you. So I think it's up, Chief. Oh, okay. I didn't know if it was going to be the, uh, the PowerPoint. So yeah, so this is uh, uh, talking about our body-worn camera project uh, and also uh, upgrading our interview room. Um, the system that we have in there currently is so old that it can't be upgraded. Um, it's it. We would try to work with IT, and that just wasn't going to have to have wasn't going to happen. So next slide, please. Um, so this comes out of originally came out of the police reform from last year. Um, there was some concern that body cameras were going to be mandated last year. Um, there is still a belief that that may be coming and it's a wise idea for us to be ahead of the game a little bit. Um, some of the police reform last year also required, which became RCW 10 uh, requires custodial investigations in the field to be audio recorded uh, for juveniles for any crime and adults for felonies. 
what we are currently doing to meet that requirement is you have to pull your cell phone out and hold it in between you and the person that you're talking with. Uh, and that creates a barrier as you're trying to build a relationship when you're, when you're conversing to someone. Uh, for the interview room portion of this, um, if you're inside a police facility, you have to uh, audio and video record that. And we do not have that capability currently. We uh, share uh, space with Kitsap County Sheriff's Office, but uh, we don't have priority uh, on that. Next, please. So we did put together a work group. Uh, there were six and that was chaired by the deputy chief. They started work last June um, and they looked at four different vendors and they decided upon Axon uh, for a number of reasons, both for price and compatibility with systems that we already have, um, but it's also on the state contract. So it makes that a little bit easier in terms of pure procurement. So we are working with Heidi for that procurement piece. Um, it includes an upgrade to our tasers to the most um, up, updated as uh, right now. And it also includes some virtual reality training, which we'll talk about. So the, the program that we decided on was the core plus. Uh, the next stage up from the core plus uh, included uh, equipping our vehicles. Axon requires that all of our vehicles be upgraded, and that was going to push the cost of this program into seven figures, which we didn't feel was appropriate. We can get uh, everything that we need with the body camera. So the Core Plus program includes the camera, the docking station, the upgraded taser, um, in pairing it with what's called their dynamic bundle. We also get an additional uh, program for redacting, which is I appreciate the council providing us with an extra FTE, um, but this will assist them in their work. It allows the AI to examine for, so if I say, I don't wanna look at the mayor's face anymore, it'll actually blur it out throughout the entire video. It makes it much, much easier so that staff does not have to go frame by frame through an hour long video uh, and redact faces. Um, the VR training, like I said, uh, also has a, a portal. Um, all of this is cloud-based servers, so we don't have any physical servers that will be associated with the city, uh, and no responsibility from IT. But there's a portal to our servers. So if we have, say, an incident at Chimes and Lights and a number of community members take video, we no longer have to go to them and say, I need to hold on to your phone until we can download a video. We can provide everyone um, uh, the, the link to the portal and they can actually go and upload it themselves and we can receive that. Um, all of the, the servers are CGIS protected and CGIS class and that also prevents any issues of um, viruses being uploaded to city systems. And then the interview room is a two camera advanced. Um, we do have a room that's already set up for two cameras so that will be just perfect. So this is the core, uh, this is the camera that's currently out there. It is, a, we do have 24 hour system and uh, support and it has what's called extended buffering. So it's always on and always recording. So when the officer turns it on, uh, it has the previous 90 seconds. So it's not just from when the, the officer presses the button. We work 10 hour and 45 minute shifts. Uh, that, that 12 hours of recording provides enough to cover that shift. There will be extras that are included in this. So if we do need to, uh, you know, if somebody's working a longer shift, they can come in and swap out cameras. Uh, what's also interesting about the, the, the new and upgraded body cameras is that they have different signal triggers. So you don't just have to press the button on the camera. Um, as we all know, um, in times of high stress, people can forget to do things that are not uh, regularly part of their uh, experience. So there is a trigger that is on the officer's holster. So if they draw their firearm, it'll automatically turn that camera on. And if they draw their taser and use any of the aspects of that, that taser, whether it be arcing it, turning it on or deploying it with the cartridge, uh, it also triggers that camera to turn on. And the other neat feature is that any camera that is within, um, I think 40 to 50 feet will also turn on. Um, so if we are on a call with Bremerton PD or Polsbo PD and they have the same camera system, it will turn their cameras on. And I know that Kitsap County Sheriff's Office is still evaluating which system they're going to go to. But if as uh, our regional partners, they also go with Axon, that allows us all to, to integrate much more seamlessly. The Taser 7 is the latest model. Um, it provide, I won't get into all the details, um, but it provides a lot more capabilities than the ones that we currently have. Um, it also comes with a training suit. So a lot of what we are doing with the mandated patrol tactics training 
uh, are is scenario based. So instead of just talking through things, we actually set up scenarios where people have. Uh, it's kind of like a, uh, you know the, the the books we used to read when we were kids. You know, choose your own adventure. So you could go into a scene and it could go five or six different ways depending on how you react to the stimulus that you're provided. But by having suits like this, officers are allowed to develop the muscle memory and the decision making and actually be able to use the tools um, without pretending. Um, the, the, the training also comes with the VR component. Um, that is a first person perspective. They're building up a fairly substantial library and, and the biggest draw to that, not only that they're 15 minute scenarios so people can do that every week, but it's not just four scenarios. So they can go in there and make choices um, on how to deescalate, how to be more empathetic to victims um, and in a lot of other areas that, that we don't have the capability of training now we can do with this system. Next. <clears throat> So this is uh, the best picture I could get of the VR system, but again, it's a set of goggles that goes on. It comes with that headset. Uh, we do provide, or they, we are provided with train the trainer um, capabilities so that we can have our sergeants all be these trainers that can work off of the tablet. And the CERT pistol is, it's an inert firearm that, that they can swap out for their live firearm. So if they're in a scenario and they determine that they need to use that level of force, they can. There are also tasers that they can use uh, that integrate with the system. And as we discussed, it's a broad scenario library that both has tactical, critical thinking uh, and community engagement. <clears throat> Uh, the interview room, um, one of the nice features about this, because it is cloud-based, it can actually now be accessed from anywhere. Our old system, uh, we had to put a cord through the wall and the detective that was partnered with the interviewing detective would need to sit in that next room. This now provides us the capability not only to watch from other areas, but if, let's say tonight, there would be something that was going on and I get a phone call that says, hey, chief, we'd really like you to watch this and provide any perspective. I can actually sit at my house and watch it online. Um, it is all cloud-based storage unlimited. So if we have a number of different interviews and videos that, that we need to store, there's no issues um, with, with that storage capability. And it does allow us, so um, if you are in interviewing a suspect and your partner is watching you do that, they can click and annotate any areas that they would wanna go back and re-examine. <clears throat> so from an evidence perspective, um, by being able to take this digital evidence and store it on those servers, <clears throat> When we need to provide it to the prosecutors or, or from a public records request, we no longer have to do what we're doing now, which is download it, place it on a, on, on a, a CD or a thumb drive, and then hand carry it or provide it to whomever has, has the right to see that. We can actually provide a link. Uh, we can provide a link that um, allows unlimited access. We can provide a link that is only able to be used once. And the way that the system works is um, it tracks all of that. So I can go in and say, I have provided this to council member Cucciardi and every single time he accesses it, I can see what he has done with it so that we can have a little bit more perspective. Cause again, this is still evidence. Um, the prosecutors are looking forward to it. Um, similar with when we, we purchased digital on cue for some of our other digital media, again, they can just access whatever they need, excuse me, whatever they need from their desks without having to come and ask us for it. Um, <clears throat> It does have good analytical tools. It allows us to search based upon either the officer, the case number, any other types of tags that we determine are appropriate. Um, and it allows us to um, set retention schedules for public records so that when we no longer need them, it will it, it, you know, have a tickle file that says, hey, this, this, this video is no longer required and it's up in five days. Do you still want to delete it? You can make that decision. It won't delete it on its own, but it allows a little bit better management by remo removing any human error um, so that we don't end up maintaining things that we're, we are not legally obligated to do so. Uh, this is our five-year quote, it's good through May 15th. So it is a five-year program. They do refresh the, uh, all of the equipment uh, 30 and 60 months. Um, what by bundling the, the training program, uh, the redaction software and the core plus, as opposed to going a la carte, we're saving about $91,000. So just for the body camera system, uh, the five year total is 326 and change by including the interview room, which is on a 60 month 
um, uh, contract as well. That bumps it up a little bit. So the total is $359,000 and change for a five-year contract. Uh, we do not pay until they've delivered. They're about 90 days out or so um, for the body cameras and they're six months out for the interview room. Um, the, the hope is that we can um, move relatively quickly so that we don't have another quote. This is the second quote that we've had and it has gone up a little bit just because of supply chain issues and, and the rest of inflation. Um, we are working with the guild um, to ensure that, that the policies and the procedures that we have in place uh, work for all of us. Um, so that's really everything that we're doing in a nutshell, and I'm uh, available for whatever questions you may have. So I just want to share to you, I'm, I'm surprised that the legislature didn't uh, take action on this and required of all agencies this last session. I'm, I'm, I feel pretty confident, and so does the chief, that that day is coming. And when that day comes, everybody's going to be looking to procure these the same systems. And I think costs will go up and timelines will be much longer. Um, I think the best thing is it does for our community and our police officers is it, it exonerates our officers 90% of the time when people make claims that our officer did something wrong. And uh, I think this is a valuable tool. Um, uh, to, to our police officers to have. I've talked to Noah about how we can fund this. We have criminal justice funding that we can use that can only be used for police equipment. And uh, it's about $70,000 a year. And, and uh, we're, this is probably was going to be a request in next the next biennial budget. But uh, Chief and I have been talking about trying to move this forward ahead of that timeline. So questions or, or comments? Jay? Yeah, just a quick comment, and I'm sure John has seen the same thing at Kitsap Transit. When we put cameras on our buses, it was amazing uh, how many uh, complaints uh, were found in the favor of the drivers. And when we showed that evidence to parents uh, or administrators, uh, it was amazing how many, uh, over time, how many of those went away. And so I'm totally in favor, and I actually believe 90% is a low number of what it will exonerate the police. I think it will be much higher. So I'm all in favor of this. It's a funding issue. I understand that, but I would say definitely move forward. Yeah, I have no data to support my percentage. I was I grabbed that out of the air. <laughs> so Council Member Chang? I choose to support this, and the only thing that makes me a little queasy is that it's cloud-based. Um, I think that's certainly the way to go because it's convenient and, you know, all the things you're thinking about one-time links and being able to track people's use is very state-of-the-art, but I'm just a little uncomfortable about the potential for hacking. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, they're on top of it being part of their business, but it's just something I'm still a little uncomfortable with. Um, yeah, so, so all, of, all the servers are CGIS secure. Um, this is an international company, and to my knowledge, there has not been an issue um, with any of this being hacked. It's always a valid, valid concern, but absolutely, most most of our servers in the city are are cloud based already. Other comments or questions? I'm supportive. Okay, Mark. I'm supportive as well, and I also like the fact that it's got unlimited uh, storage because that's one of the things that can get you really quick in cloud-based storage as your data increases, data files increase. So uh, I'm all for this. Well, all right. Um, we're gonna get moving on it, talk to finance, and you'll probably just see a contract uh, here in the next couple of council meetings to get this rolling. Appreciate it, thank you. <clears throat> all right, it's not quite nine o'clock, so. I figure I'd add one more thing here tonight. So no, uh, in all seriousness, I'm out next week. And so I've got a couple of things I just want to share on my mayor's report. Um, and then we can go to good of the order and, and get on with our evening. But um, got some exciting news in the middle of our meeting tonight um, from Congressman Kilmer's office is that we're one of 15 finalist projects that he intends to move forward for our Bay Street project. Um, for a federal appropriation. So pretty excited. Um, that's, that's for the street. So um, other things that uh, have been, uh, that have 
come to light here in, in this last week. Um, some eligibility requirements changed this year uh, at at the uh, at TIB uh, at Transportation Improvement Board, and will be eligible to apply for street uh, paving dollars. So we're submitting a grant application for that too. I know that'd make John happy. So um, we'll see what that what that brings along. And um, you know we we uh, the county has the. CDBG home funding, which is HUD dollars that come in. Uh, we, we were able to get about $300,000 uh, for that Lipper Street project a year ago that we're going to deploy this year. Uh, and uh, every three years, we have the option to withdraw from the county's program and start our own problem program. And I talked to Bonnie uh, from the county uh, earlier this week, and based on our current population, we would re if we started our own program, it would be we would receive one hundred nineteen thousand dollars annually. But the the downside to that is we'd have to hire staff to administer that and complete all the federal reporting requirements. Um, I don't think we'd have any money left over to 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 do any do a program. So I'm gonna uh, checking here with you that uh, we want to continue our relationship with Kitsap County and apply annually. And and if we get some money every two or three years, we're coming out way ahead. So I and my last item is we were doing some research uh, for one Nick for the for the uh, grant for. Uh, the improvements at uh, Givens. And we had to go back to the November 1930 uh, council meeting minutes. And uh, we determined that uh, we acquired that property from the Kiwanis. And uh, I know that pains Mark and Cindy and I as Rotarians, um, but Kiwanis actually did the city right. And uh, th that site was, was formerly the city fairgrounds um, before we bought it from the Kiwanis. And uh, they sold it to us for $2,500 and carried a no interest installment loan. So free money that, you know, that uh, these, these uh, low interest loans, I guess, aren't, they've been around for quite a while. And uh, other things that I gleaned from that council uh, my meeting minutes were that evening, the council approved the purchase of a large custom-made toolbox for the city dump truck for $19.40 and the purchase of two domed light fixtures for the council chambers. They appropriated 50 cents that night and approved that expenditure. So discussions Mr. also- Mr. Took, Mayor, yeah. I, I wanted noted that you also pointed out that my name was not in attendance at that meeting. You're so. correct. That is, yeah, this was 92 you. years ago. You've been around a while, but not that long. No. And we had discussions, they had discussions that evening regarding sidewalks, stormwater, and tree removal. It's funny how some things don't change. So it's someone, it's, I, I plan to have some fun with this. And, and Janine and I have, because we're uh, digitalizing all of these minutes. And, and I want to bring some of those, you know, what we did 50, 75, or 100 years ago at a council meeting uh, back once in a while. So all I have for my mayor's report. So uh, Cindy will be uh, taking charge next next Tuesday. And is there anything for the good of the order? All right. I kept you long enough and wore you out. Have a good evening. We'll Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Bye, everybody.